talk about beating back enrollment loss by becoming focused on experience, which is in our mind the top of the pyramid for what you have to be to survive into the 22nd century. Because people expect this of you. They expect a really quality experience, not just humdrum, I'm one of many, I'm a, I'm a ghost in the machine, moving along, nobody even looked at me today as I went through school, right? And that's part of a reaction to something that's been going on in America for a really long time. So I want to get into that a little bit. <clears throat> First, I'm going to talk to you about the trajectory of the market overall. You heard a little bit of this with, if you were with me last night. Uh, then what are the drivers behind it? Like, really, what's happening? Like, why is this happening? Um, that kids are leaving and they're going to alternatives and they're doing all these other things. I mean, a lot of what you guys are doing in schools and districts is better than it was 50 years ago, okay? Maybe we're not living in the, in the, in the movie Grease, right, times where everything was great and people just broke out into song and dance all the time. Um, but, you know, it's a time when uh, you're doing things better and yet kids are still descending into madness easier, right? Like they're not making it. So what is happening? So the drivers are really interesting. And then what is the right fit? Because when I talk to the really big districts, I'm talking at a different level of sophistication and understanding. And, and they're actually usually more immobile than the medium and smaller ones. The thinking is locked. The orchestration and administration is locked in. Whereas the mid-tier and the smaller, quite frankly, as we go across the country, is moving faster. Um, and there's something to be said about that in terms of how you even think about your structure as a really large district. OK, so I showed this yesterday. As some of you guys weren't with us already, so I will share it again. And it's in your special new report, the newest one. The data now shows that 73% is what remains of all the student population, the 55 million some students in the United States in public education. The rest are out. So charters sort of still count. So if you look at the where the feds usually communicate this, they're like, hey, you know, we have like 98% of everybody and there's a tiny percent out in private school. And then, you know, there's a little bit of homeschooling. They don't actually know at the federal level really what the numbers of homeschoolers are because there's six states that don't require you to even register anywhere. You can just be out. No one knows, right? You're just gone, uh, which is interesting by itself. But um, when you look at the actual numbers of their growth, it's unbelievable. So if you were to study this data, just pretend you're an analyst like me for a second, look at this data. Homeschooling, largest segment now, and growing faster than anything else. Why? What is happening? Make your comment. What do you think? Having homeschooled my kids, I can tell you, it's uh, uh, personalization, a lot more personalized uh, attention. That's the only reason we live. Personalized attention. To the kids, but there are specific needs that they have. Right, but I can also guarantee you that when you homeschooled your kids, you did it with love. You had an agreement you know only you could My give. My wife did with love, I did with discipline. <laughs> <laughs> you were the hard ass, right? That's awesome. That's awesome. But I want you to think about the invisible ingredients, okay? Because our survey showed the number one issue nationally is social and emotional needs of kids is a runaway train wreck, OK? So his wife was doing the what was really needed. He was still like you guys are. It's like, I'm going to discipline you when you come here. You're going to do what I say, right? That's still also needed, right? But it's this other mothering side that we thought the outside world, the parents were doing. Weren't they doing that? When did they stop doing that? Well, maybe they're not all stopped doing that, but there's certainly some sort of massive gap now, right? Okay. 
The enrollment loss in school districts is a problem larger than charter growth. These are the statistics for Los Angeles, Oakland, and San Diego. And really, their enrollment gains in the charters around them, these are the three most contested areas for charters in the United States, by the way, um, amount to a little over half of the district enrollment loss. That was surprising. This was a study done by ba Washington Bothell University. And this is what they found. They're like, what, what? Because, you know, the unions in pretty much all of the debate is like charters. No, 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 no. Charters are you. They're just a little you. They're like a baby you, right? So that's fine. They're still public, right? Well, what happens when people are like, no, I'm out. Forget I'm out. all your stuff. I'm out. Then what do you do? Okay. So I want to show you this cycle, and you probably can't all read this whole thing, but I'll sort of go over it with you. We're in a rev inverse growth model from what education was 150 years ago. So it started out as a little house on the prairie school, one room schoolhouse, right? Aggregated, and somewhere along the line in the 30s, some guy came along and like, let's create a manufacturing model, and we're gonna have classes and grades and march kids through this gradation pattern of change, right? Remember that? Okay, so then everybody did that. And then when there's a heyday during Greece movie time, in the 50s and 60s, and everybody was like, great, and highest graduation rates ever, and then it's been a decline ever since. So if you understand change curve, where's this thing going? So there's an inverse growth model happening at the same time. So school choice, blended and flipped learning, my book that came out a couple years ago on the consumerization is happening, and I even have people calling me and going, how come all your predictions are coming true? Like, what's happening? Well, it's not brain surgery. This is kind of easy. Um, Increasing homeschoolers, this whole curve is a disaggregation, decentralization wave. It's a cultural wave. And that wave has already happened in other industries with its own drivers, right? Retail. Who's killing it in retail right now? Amazon. They're placeless. Who's killing it in transportation? Uber. Although I think Lyft is pulling ahead, right? FedEx almost killed the post office. Consumerization at the growth rate that it's at in private sector homeschooling is on a trajectory to carve out 50% of public education within the next five years because it's now culturally popular. It is very popular in California to go out, form small consortiums, turn somebody's garage in the neighborhood into the homeschool, and all the parents take turns taking a day off. This is a cultural trend, and it's increasingly being talked about. So at the opposite side of this, <clears throat> you, have a re, you have a new trend that will kick in, and we predict it's going to kick in in 2020, where physical schools are gonna go, uh-oh, we gotta do something. And they're gonna focus on quality experience. Why? Because it's the number one silver bullet on homeschooling. Lack of socialization. That's what everyone says. Well, it wasn't really true, because my husband Doug's uh, daughter in common with his first wife, uh, she was socialized like you can't believe. I think we had her in soccer, and I don't know how many other things. She's, it's, ballet, she was over there singing in some other church that we weren't even a member of. She was part of their choir. You know, there's all kinds of stuff going on. And then she has that whole huge Latino side of the family, and they were always together with a million kids. So there was like, yeah, there was a lot of socialization. So that's a little hard one to argue, particularly in some communities, right? Um, but that physical presence, if you create it at a really high art where it's a game of life, right? Like you're there, you're like having like meaningful social experience, right? And there's something thrilling about the esports activity you get to do or the hands-on robots project that you're gonna do that you're not gonna do in homeschool, right? Those things, those science experiments and those other things that you can do as a hub of quality experience and the, and the $50,000, you know, like, uh, Home, home experiment things that you could, you know, there are uh, saws and things to do woodworking, 
right? Like, there's, they're not going to do that stuff at home. So there's things that you can do that are going to create quality experience. So our, our objective is, is if you focus on that, then you've created something that isn't even, wasn't even there before. It was a little bit in the 1950s, but it's a reason to be there. So now you have a reason for a physical location. But does that physical location have to be the same as it was in every other respect? No. So I want your mind to go in the direction of what happens when I blend learning so that all the learning is done through this magnificent uh, automatic, uh, fully adaptive digital curriculum with all the moving parts and pieces and individualized pathways. And it converges via algorithms into these grand small group projects and the things that cause you to be there physically. So now you have, instead of two roads, online learning over here, physical learning over there, a little blending, a little like, oh yeah, I might use some adaptive curriculum in the back of the room once in a while, or only for the kid that's too fast in math, I let him go back there and play math games, right? That's blending to most teachers. No, 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 no. You're going to take your whole enterprise and flip it like Uber flipped the market and Amazon flipped the market. And you're going to say, I'm running everything via my giant dashboard and my amazing learning center dashboard that watches all the motion of all the kids like, like an air traffic controller center. And then as they arrive in Denver, which is the math point 101, they all converge and they have to go to room 1B and we flight in the teacher, the pilot for that class. When you start to think like Uber thought, how do I converge the right people at the right moment in the right place? Now you're looking at an experience that we've never seen before in education. We're gonna play a game tomorrow morning. Every 30 seconds, every player is gonna move like they're driven by algorithms. So you can, so you can experience what it's like and see what I'm talking about. Okay, because if Uber can do it, you guys can do it. You're all way smarter, right? After that, you're going to start having the experience of going, wow, I can have like digital learning planners selling my services back to the homeschoolers and pull them all in under my umbrella. That's what Lambert's Real ISD did in California. What happens if I am the planner extraordinaire? Because you still got to do your standards, I'm telling you. You're going to have to pass the state test as a homeschooler, right? So why don't you come in, sit down with me and my guides in each subject, and I'll write you your custom pathway. And I'll actually issue you the resources you need. Now go away. If you want to do it at home, fine. But come in for the football game. Or come in for the art lab. Okay, now I've just totally flipped everything on its head. You see how this works? So that's what I'm talking about in terms of like increasing specialty teaching and service segmentation, and then eventually full Uberization. And eventually what I call the education megalopolis, which is a transit pattern beyond the district into a state level or multi-state or whole country level. So the sharing back and forth, and I'm using you as my most excellent math teacher who dresses up like Einstein and arrives via screen as my teacher for lecture Math 2001B, and you arrive at the exact point as needed live online when I need you in Colorado, but you live in New York. Can you see this? Right now, where we're at right now is all you guys are face planted into software big time, hardcore. Like, it's the hardest thing ever. I want you to know something, it will never get better. <laughs> Software never gets easier, it only gets harder. Ask Microsoft. Like, they'll, they'll upgrade you if you're plugged in overnight and not even tell you. <laughs> you know? And you wake up in the morning and you're like, darn it! This is now asking me to log in again at 67 times. Um, Upset by that. Every time they do a revision, it affects everything else. Maybe majorly, maybe minorly, depends on if they screwed up, and Lord knows sometimes they screwed up. If you've got 5,000 apps, which is the national average per district, 
and everybody's doing version change, you will never be done with integration. Do you see that? So we've recommended that you have a model architecture and think about it as a map, a piece map, and you start to think about transit between them, and that is workflow personalized learning. It's personalized workflow learning, and it leans on a technology that I talked about in the last two special reports that is so simple, and it's been around for 25 years, it's document management. It's simple, it's form workflow. So that's what we see happening in the next couple of years is people going, okay, I'm gonna grab all my home scores, I'm gonna get credit for all that stuff, I'm gonna give them a workflow form, and you don't have to come to school, fine. Here's your list of stuff you gotta get done. Come in for the test later. I get to count that seat time, right? Maybe in your state. Let's look at why this is all happening. So we went from that simplicity, mom and dad walking you to school every day, holding your hand. Um, before that, you were actually homeschooled. Everyone was homeschooled. Maybe there was a monastery that was the upper level, right? But pretty much everybody had like this simple thing. There were books. Things were easy, right? And then it got to the point where, oh, let's have that manufacturing monitor. Let's add complexity. I want to point something out to you. Mankind is excellent at complexifying everything. And it actually is a natural human curve that give anybody something simple and they'll overcomplicate it. And as a woman, you know this if you cook. Oh, too much salt. I just went overboard. Men cook too, right? So, But you get at that point where things just got so complicated. And I don't know any of the large districts where it's not like insane complication. And the number of rules and regulations and burdens coming down from the feds and the state and the county and everybody and their brother, too much. So complexification forces the sort of the human group spirit to seek a way out. And right now you're feeling that nationally in the form of need emotionally for your teachers. You're sensing a sense of disequilibrium like you've never felt before. That is you urging out something change, right? Mankind is doing this overall with the structure of the way education has been, and part of that is the innate awareness that it could be so much different. Does it make sense? It doesn't have to be this unbelievably bureaucratic and authoritarian. Why? Because it wasn't before. But what's happened is now we've layered on top of that existing bureaucracy even more complexity with technology. Now we have to have conversations about what does the data show us? How can we analyze this nine ways to Sunday to figure out why the failure is happening? I would contend that part of the reason the failure is happening is, is you're not built for this age. You are built for an age that no longer exists. And no matter what you do, as long as you're built this way, you will not win. You're a fish on dry land. So here's what you're dealing with. Layered on complexity. And you can feel within yourself this urging to bring order. People like Tim here at Safari saw that coming a while ago. And they built this massive repository. They knew what you were going to be dealing with. Right? So, a lesson in complexity is that it increases as you have to make modifications to an original design. So the more you try to modify on top of a design that itself is not built for the way you have to service disparity or inequity, the more it wrecks the actual organization. And eventually you end up with no organization, just a big giant confusion of complexity that no one can make sense of. 
because you're not built for this. <clears throat> so look at what, let's just look for a second at what Uber did. Uber had a moment where it was like geoanalytics. Like, I'll just put those people with these people and boom, five minutes. I'm going to save you very small fractions of time. Credit card's already preloaded. I'm going to aggregate everything up into a central app that will then geolocate all the planet at once. And then I'm going to pull down that knowledge to a specific area and I'm going to service the one, you. Technology can do this. But we don't do it in education. We don't service the one. We service the blob. And thou shalt all be normalized into this pattern. But Uber can do this with cars in real time in five minutes, right? So like, what's happening? Amazon can get you something from China in like five days, right? Like, bam. FedEx can get a package anywhere in the world overnight. That is logistics, baby. And we can do it with kids. <coughs> so <clears throat> take that big, giant complexity and ask yourself, what is the epiphany that those people had that flipped the entire organization onto its back and said, aha, new structure? What did they think of what this guy at Uber? What made him even go down that road? Inconvenience. What is the big inconvenience that we experience as a, as a society with schools? What is it? Because I'll tell you, a lot of schools come to me like, Lonnie, that's never going to work, what you're talking about. It's never going to work. I'm like, why? He goes, well, because so many parents need a babysitter. They're oblivious. They're irresponsible. They don't take care of their own kid. They're expecting us to do everything for them. Yes, there is a certain level of the population that is like that. But I would beg to differ that it's anywhere higher than 10%. So you're going to sacrifice 90% for the 10? That's fool's errand, right? Because most parents love their kids. Most. 90% at least. Maybe higher. And some of them are fools. But don't sacrifice for the fools, right? So what's that epiphany? Well, wireless mobility was an epiphany. It's like, hey, everybody can have, like, they can be anywhere. They can, you know, like, we can, that's going to be awesome, right? Like, access to the universe by voice or data from anywhere. Huge change in the structure of everything. Do you remember driving cars where you didn't have a cell phone? Like, if you broke down, you're on the side of the road. Does anybody even remember what you felt like then? That was scary. Then Amazon. What did Facebook Facebook took the sense of community and it made it virtual. It's not very good, virtual, right? It's still better to hang out in person. It's way more fun. You can pinch people and stuff and throw peas at them at Thanksgiving. It's awesome, <laughs> right? <clears throat> and we know what Uber did and we know what FedEx did. So we're looking at this as the real why behind the force and structure change. Why you can't be two channels. Here's my online group. Those are where the weird kids go. And this is my normal stuff over here. Schools, and processes, and bells ringing, and schedules, and uh, so I'm doing it. Why? Because for the last 150 years, when we left the farms, and we started to travel, and then we started to manufacture everything, and then families had three kids, and they all went different directions all day long, and then, mom, and then after the wars, moms had to work too. And now nobody saw each other all day, every day, except maybe a little bit on the weekend when they would fall asleep exhausted and take a nap. So for 150 years, we have had no real quality of life. We think we had. But the human spirit is seeking and has some sort of awareness that there's a better way. I'm not going to be a slave to a mortgage my whole life. And they have nostalgia for a way of life many of them never even really experienced. But they know they want something. What do they want? They want life. They want a quality that we don't give them. 
We make them run back and forth and to and fro and everywhere, every day. And what they want is home and significance emotionally in life. And the fact that we've taken it for so long has left the adults and parents, in many cases, incapable of raising children. So now it's on you. Social, emotional need everywhere. That means they're not getting it at home. Why? Because they're both parents work. Who has time for that anymore? So then what happens is it's on you. Well, if you move to a different structure and maybe you make every individual responsible and there's enough information and there's enough cultivating of humanity around it for a few generations, maybe we can change everything, right? We can reverse this. It's going to happen anyway, whether public education and the private schools and the charters do it, because the consumer market's already doing it. Opt-outers are everywhere. The aliens have arrived and they are us, right? Your time and your life. And you want a quality life. You don't want drudgery. And you certainly, in this generation, don't want to be treated like you're every other kid. You want something for the time you give. And it should be a buildup of you emotionally and your confidence so that you can arrive as an adult in life capable of executing on a quality life. If not, you're going to end up on drugs and crime. And what do we have an increase of both of? Right? So, I want to introduce you to the other underlying reason this is really happening, and that is as the ages of maturity have progressed for mankind, we've left the world of single identity logic. Single identity logic is what a two-year-old does. That color's blue, that color's green, this is a giraffe, this is a chicken, right? The ability to identify singularly is the lowest level of mental ability. When you can move to binary logic, two of everything, black or white, two party systems politically, it's actually pretty immature, just so you know, um, two of anything, you got online schooling or you got regular schooling, that's all you got. And we're pissed off, there's charters and privates even exist, so we're pissed off about that, okay? Binary logic is what drove the tech age, it's zeros or ones. It's pretty low level ability until you get into upper algorithm making, right? Mankind, with the advent of this phone, let me take your phone for a second, with this in your hand, you have access to the universe of all knowledge everywhere. What does that do to the map in your mind? When somebody is standing in front of you telling you something with absolute authoritarianism, how do you react? You're not going to give me the blue socks at Macy's? I'm out. I'm going to go over here. I'm going to just order them on Amazon. Anytime anybody comes at you with 100% authoritarianism, what is your reaction? Yeah, no, out. So your posture as an organization and as a human has to always be, you have choice. I'm not in your face about this. You're going to do what you're going to do. I wish you'd come to my form of logic, right? But that's sort of where mankind is. We've moved, especially the younger generation, not all of us older people, into an infinity logic scale. And their minds are mapped to the infinity of logic, right? Like there's gray and white and everything, right? And all the in-betweens. This is the call to diversity. This is the call to options. This is the driver behind choice. And it all starts with that powerful little machine in your hand. 
And that's not going away, ever, right? It might even get embedded into our arms, we don't know. But you're looking at, you're trying to still run institutions that the institution, which is a monolithic structure, is supposed to adapt to this massive diversity of all mankind. The infinity of humanity has always been true, okay? Every one of us in this room is totally different. And we try to take every one of us in a room and like stick them in a box, all the same. But we're now at a maturity point with our technology where we can actually look at you individually as an individual, every one. And that's what we have to do. We can't continue to be the same structures we've always been, because we lose. We will get run over by the outside world. We will be the taxis when Uber came, right? One superintendent said, I don't want to be the last dinosaur. Yeah, you don't. Okay, so I've talked enough about that thing, but I want to tell you, when I talk about experience, I'm not talking about going back to this. Like, this was dangerous, right? But really, when you think about what they were doing back then, is they were like playing for blood. They, they, these things were 20 feet tall. 20, 30 feet tall. Look at the guy falling in the background, right? Like, people, like, the parents thought this was okay, right? You're not only going to have an experience, you're going to have an experience, right? Some of you are going to get killed doing it. So what I'm talking about is experience from the viewpoint of that blend of tech and humanity. But please don't forget the humanity part, right? And the wicked problem that you're trying to deal with is not the thing that's internal to the organization. It is external. The form that you are is not fit to the 22nd century, right? So the assumptions are what I want you to think of as your homework. Your assumptions are time, how time should work. Your assumptions are place, and the feel of the place probably doesn't have sofas that you could spill things on, but it should. Because if it feels like home, people won't homeschool. If it feels like you just went to a hospital, you won't want to go because it feels big and the hallways are wide and there's echoes and there's nothing friendly or human about it. If it feels like it can do the teaching, you're going to want it to do the teaching. You may not be able to hear the sound on this, but you can see what it does. This is AI teaching you molecular structure. through physical manipulatives. So who's teaching here? Is there a human teacher teaching this? Yes, the coder, the UI UXer, the instructional designer is teaching you something right now. She may not be there, she's at a distance. She lives in Lisbon, Portugal, and she built this. And she's teaching you right now. So roles and responsibilities are questionable. Every school that I know is piling on more and more and more and more and more and more to the teacher. It's a sin. It's something I, I find abhorrent because I wouldn't do that to my worst enemy. Ask you to do everything. So you have to think about what are all those roles? One of the best things you could do in PD when you get home is call everybody together and let's, let's do an exhaustive half day of just making a great giant whiteboard list of everything we do. Every little piece of it from disciplining, to providing bathroom passes, to letting kids cry on our shoulder, to cleaning up vomit in the back corner. Because you know you all do these things. And now you gotta also be the best lesson planner in the universe for your subject, really. Wow. And then start to back away from that and going, what can I do for these people that are so great to take some of that off of them? What can technology do for them? 
Because if they don't start thinking about what technology can do for them, rather than something they have to do, we're all doomed. Right? It should look like this. It should be helpful. It should be doing some of the teaching. I know that's sacrilege to a teacher. But I don't want her doing everything. I want her to be helped so that every kid gets a fully personalized path. So we're gonna, we're, you know, we've talked about workflows a lot and where workflow is really gonna go. This is in your special report. You can read all about it. You probably have one trillion questions. There's four or five companies that have come out of the woodwork and said, yeah, Lonnie, we're already doing that, right? But this shouldn't be hard. It should be simple, because simple is always better. Simple gets used by humans. If it's super hard, nobody's going to do it. This is a model architecture. You know, like Safari Montage has got this part over here that does the learning object repository, which you need a repository. You've got to put stuff somewhere, right? But then you've got all these other pieces and parts from some of these other companies that do these full gamified learning pieces. And that's doing some of the teaching, right? And you got to create your plot map of all of it. This is a plot map of one subject, one grade, one standard. Looks pretty complicated. You want a teacher to do this for all 30 kids. This is what it looks like to just do that for three levels, slow, medium, really fast kid. Now it starts to look like air traffic control job. And it's not a human job. This is a, ma this is a machine job. Make sense? This is your next stage of algorithms. You will see algorithms emerging in this market from a software field that are simple algorithms. They're not the scary bias ones. So don't go down that road of like, I'm terrified and biased of algorithm, blah, algorithms are scary. No, because the simple ones are going to be decision trees. If this, then that. Missed this, then go back here. Got this done, good, here's a reward star, move up to the next level. Okay, that's decision tree logic, and it's the easiest thing to program ever. Anyone can write those algorithms. The next net one is gonna be nearest neighbor algorithm, which is auto cohorting. That's what Uber does. That's also what the trucking business does, right? All these packages gotta get to Detroit overnight, put them on this bus, that plane, that train, that bus. Okay, that's simple logic too. The other kind will be notifications, granular auto alerts and auto calendaring, and then the conditional probability algorithm Bayes, which is what Google is based on, okay? Those are simple and they're doable, okay? And start talking to your vendors now to put pressure on them to start using this auto logic because when you do, we'll have a revolution that we need. <clears throat> Starting point is your planners, your content, your schedule, and your systems, okay? We started in the last round the discussion about digital learning UI UX standards. Learning Council has drafted them. And the next stage is to take them out and give them to all our Learning Council committees, have you vet them again, make them different levels or whatever, and then we're gonna publish them. So Chris McMurray, who's here? Chris, can you stand for a second? Chris is going to help the Learning Council run the whole EduJedi program. Um, yay. Uh, former superintendent from Evergreen. Um, the next plan is to take that and then also start helping schools directly with consulting, which normally Dr. Kaffitz and I haven't been able to do because we've got to get to the next city for the next event, right? So we don't turn around and sweep up after ourselves. So Chris is going to do that, which is great. So next year, barriers is my focus. How do we remove them? What are they? How do you get over them? Any ideas you have? I want to hear them. Because the Learning Council isn't just who's in this room right now. There's thousands of other districts that come in the other cities, can't make it to a central location. I need you to help them, because usually the people who come here are the best of the best. Right? So help me help them so we can move the whole country forward. Is it good? Okay, thank you for listening.